Hello, and welcome to the Beyond Storytime, a collab series. I'm Christina Cantrell from the National Writing Project, and today is June 25th, 2020. This series emerged from a conversation that started back in April. At that point, with school buildings closed for shelter in place, a group of teachers, children's book authors, and illustrators came together to share their experiences and imagine what was possible. During this initial conversation, many creative ideas surfaced along the way that educators and artists might collaborate to support both young people's interests, as well as to support young people in being writers and authors themselves. Over the course of our series, we'll continue this conversation by diving into the ideas that surfaced and spend time developing them together. I'm thrilled now to turn the mic over to this wonderful group that we have convened here today. Katie McKay from the Heart of Texas Writing Project will be our host and will facilitate this discussion. Thank you all for making the time to be here and for sharing your beautiful work and your thinking. Take it away, Katie. Well, we're all, we're really excited to be here together. Um, I'm excited for each of our authors and illustrators that have joined us to introduce themselves in a little bit. Um, just to give a little bit of context to our conversation today, can you guys see my screen? Cool. Um, when on our last conversation, one thing that um, I was thinking a lot about in my work in coaching teachers who use writing workshop in their classroom was about the challenge that teachers often face about how to make more visible the processes that authors and illustrators use and how individual those are to arrive to their eventual product that they've published. Teachers of writing workshop often use mentor texts and, and um, the illustrations and the text of our favorite published book authors. And those, those are fabulous demonstrations also for students who are trying to develop their own processes and, and build and make their own books. Um, but sometimes it seems kind of mysterious how the, how the authors and illustrators got to that place. And so one question that came up at our last conversation was how can we, you, you know, take advantage of, of um, this opportunity to talk with authors and illustrators to hear more about what to kind of unveil the mystery and show us more about what it is like for them and their individual processes. Um, so uh, we thought just to give a little context of a writing workshop classroom and how our conversation today might help teachers is um, in a writing workshop classroom, the cycle of the writing process looks a little different than sometimes writing, teachers of writing have used in the, in the past. Sometimes you might see in a classroom a very linear writing workshop um, or writing process that says, first think of an idea, then choose one, now draft. Now it's very linear and sometimes it feels very quick. The drafting part comes sometimes too soon for students. And then the revising part ends up being just trying to get kids drafts longer <laughs> because they hadn't spent a lot of time really like digging around and delving into their ideas before they were supposed to already be producing. Um, and so what this, what this cycle here shows is um, first and foremost, us starting with students' life experiences. And we'll hear a little bit from authors today about how their ideas Can you hear me now? Okay. Um, so, so this cycle here um, starts first and foremost with students' life experiences. So in a writing workshop classroom, students are choosing their own topics. And that can be tough, like figuring out what topic am I going to choose? And so some of what authors today might talk about might um, link to this idea of starting with our life experiences. The majority of what we'll talk about is really going to be focusing on these first three parts here. And you can see that, um, that the more robust this part of our workshop can be, the less teachers might feel like they're really pulling hairs and, um, and, and battling to get kids to have more on the paper. The more time kids have to generate and collect ideas in a space like a writer's notebook or in a folder for the younger students, um, collecting around a topic. So once a topic has been collect, decided on, all the time they can collect lots of different ideas. Um, that can then help them have like a big mound of clay to start working with. And then also starting to design their text, even before drafting, just starting to imagine. I know Mika's going to talk today a little bit about that, this idea of designing the different parts and what order, imagining what order they might come in. 
So as we talk today, we're really going to, most of our talk is going to focus on these first three parts that I think was going to be really helpful to teachers who are sometimes struggling with how do I, how do I show kids how to do this? Um, and then on this next slide here, um, if, if that cycle, we're looking at the big picture of a writing workshop classroom, then we have to think as a teacher of how we're going to actually in the details in the day to day with the kids help to guide them through. And in a workshop classroom, we want to as much as possible get out of the kids way because we know they have important things to say. We know they have motivations and audiences and purposes of their own. But we also want to offer that guidance that, that, they, that the, all authors need from a writing community whenever they're in the process of writing. And so many lessons is the way that teachers can do that in a brief, quick way, give tips that help the authors to keep their, um, their work moving forward. And so um, when I've worked with my mentor, Dr. Randy Bomer, in the past, one way he's helped me really think about the variety that it, a mini lesson can take is first thinking about bigger themes. So I might teach a mini lesson that has to do with writerly lives. That might be thinking about what does my workspace look like? What tools do I use? Um, what are my rituals that I do to help me get into my writing space? Um, how do I manage distractions? So each of these themes, imagining your audience, you know, um, would have you thinking about your audience, or imagining your reader would have you thinking about your audience. There's always bigger themes. And then each of those themes would have more minute or more focused mini lesson topics. So for example, if I'm teaching conventions, I could teach a mini lesson about punctuation or about capitalization or about spelling. There's, there's a myriad of topics that would go with each, each theme. And then I have to decide, how am I going to demonstrate that for kids? So after I've decided, okay, I know where my kids are. They're all just trying to get in the habits of writers. We're going to do a lesson about writerly lives. And they've really been struggling with managing distractions. So that's going to be my topic for today. Now I have to decide, how am I going to demonstrate that mini lesson? And there's a lot of options. And the teachers often default to modeling it themselves, right? And that's a great way sometimes. Um, so I might model one way that I manage my distractions is I sit, you know, with my body turned in a way where I see beautiful things that are going to inspire me, but I don't see my best friend because that might distract me, right? So I can model that. Another way I might do it is, is get out a mentor text and, and say, you know, one thing that an author might do when they were writing this is say, you know, so, and so on. What, what I'm hoping that this conversation helps with today is gives us a lot of examples of how we can hear from published authors to, that is a way of demonstrating those many lessons. And so what's really exciting about what we're about to do now is we will end up through a 45 minute conversation coming up with dozens of ways that we could teach on any of these themes and any of these topics um, probably, but again, closer back, I'm going to go back to that last slide, thinking more of the early part of our process. Um, because that's part of the part that that can sometimes be difficult to unveil for students. So we're going to have each author and illustrator share a little bit about themselves, and we're going to have the pleasure of seeing some images from their process and hearing them talk about that. So um, Shanda, do you want to go ahead? Sure. Um, hi, guys. I'm Shanda McCloskey, and um, I'm really pumped to be in this talk today because I think that uh, demystifying the what's under the surface of creating any anything whether it's a book a story or even something like you know understanding how money works or how families work or how you know anything when i get to see the stuff that nobody kind of talks about that much that's when it gets really really interesting and captivating to me as a child and as an adult. So I think this is just really rich stuff we're gonna talk about. So, um, but first of all, um, I am an author and an illustrator. I live in a, like a little north of Atlanta, Georgia. And most of my books so far have been uh, STEM friendly titles. So we talk about robotics and drones and research and things like that. So. Um, and, and a lot about childhood and technology in general. So it's a sort of a bigger conversation 
that um, my books can can open up for students, which is really enjoyable for me. Um, and when they um, when this group asked me to just kind of break down my process about how I work on a book or a story into just a few slides, that was pretty difficult. But um, but I kind of tried my best and uh, I learned a lot myself that I didn't realize. And I, what I also learned uh, kind of retrospective is how much of my ideas, and I would bet that these other authors would agree with me that, that um, a really good book really just starts as an idea, like you're planting a tiny seed in your heart, in your head, and it really does take time and nourishment to grow into something that's really good. And not every, not every, not every seed's going to grow into the perfect plant, the perfect story. It some are going to die. Some, only some are going to make it through. And um, and how much time growing that that idea takes. So. And uh, you can go on to the next slide and I'll sort of start to show you. Even the first things you're saying, Shanda, makes me think right away about how teachers can talk to kids about how important reflection on their own processes yeah. is. You even said, you know, we're looking at all of these books that you've published. You even said that the fact that you were going to share your process with someone else helped you to reflect on it as well. And I think that's so true for authors of any age. Yeah. It really did. It was really cool to to stop and just look back. And also that each one of my books kind of took a different process. Um, it it isn't always the same. I mean, it may generally have a similar skeleton because that's just the way my mind understands that I would have to start with an idea and then you know. But it they're all a little bit different. They're all like different kids that I have to raise up. So, um, but this first slide kind of just shows you, I mostly start with some idea that I think is cute or cool, or like for one of my books, um, Dolly 1.0, I just wanted to, first of all, I wanted to draw robots. Second of all, I wanted to make a book that had a little more of a feminine aesthetic and a girl turning a doll into a robot. I just wanted to run with that, so I did. This particular story here that I'm showing that I'm working on is a book that has not been published. It has not sold. It has not. Um, I'm truly in the middle of it. So I thought when I was making these slides, this is really raw, good stuff here. So I usually just start with an idea, and um, the play on words of punk rock. Um, it's about, it's a story uh, that I, that I want to, I don't even know the story completely yet, but it's a, a rock that's been trampled on his whole life because he's on the ground and people step on him and he turns kind of tough and, and, uh, just turns into a real, like a, a real punk, you know, and he treats people badly, but he's been treated badly. So through the story, somehow we sort of see that you know, the reason some people act the way they do, maybe there may be underlying causes and that there's some real hurt and maybe softness under there, under the toughness. So I just usually start with notes, notebook, maybe writing notes in my phone. I've got sticky notes everywhere. The notes may come at the strangest times while I'm walking in the shower, trying to go to sleep, but I cannot sleep unless I just go ahead and get up, write whatever I'm thinking down on my phone and then I can rest and go back to sleep. And because I'm also an artist and illustrator, um, there's a lot of visuals already stirring in my head. So I usually like to bounce back and forth with some writing, maybe some drawing if I have an idea of the way something might could look. And I just start to make random sketches and lots of random notes. All right, next. Why? Well, I'm going to just hop in really quick because I was just sure. scribbling down. There's so many lessons that I feel like could have come out of, and I would think of more if I rewatch the recording, I'm sure. But um, some of the things you talked about is how you get your topic. Um, something cute and cool is something that you said. 
I think that would be great advice there for kids, right? It's like, well, if I think this is cute and cool, you mean that's okay to write about it? You know, there's such a the authority figure of a teacher can sometimes get the kids just guessing what they think the teacher wants them to say. Mm-hmm. But telling kids that what you think is cute and cool is what you should be writing about and what you should, you said, I just wanted to run with that. And so I did, you know, just knowing I want to run with that. And so I'm going to, um, that's the, that's what tells me that's a good topic, you know? Um, they play, you're playing with words. You're also imagining that the backstory of the characters, you're kind of starting with the character in a way, but you start imagining his backstory. Yeah. Like, how is it that he came to be this way? And, and really knowing things about him, probably that not all that might even make it into the book, but you knowing it helps you to know him better and the way he might react to things. Yes. Yes. You yes. Feel a, yes. Um, and then I love what you shared about how your notes come out in lots of different places, sticky notes. And when you're in the shower before sleep, you need to write it down. So we talk to kids sometimes about how their notebooks need to be portable because you never know when one of those ideas might hit you. And so having something with you all the time where you could write those things down because your whole life and everywhere you go is the one of those seeds might, might pop up that you need to quick get into soil um, or at least a place where it can stay fresh. Um, and then the last thing that, that you said that really stood out to me is that idea of moving back and, por- and forth between visuals and text is really, I think, so important because um, when, we, when a teacher said that I'm teaching writing now, sometimes we see drawing not as writing. And really those two things go together. Drawing is writing. You can create a whole book and a whole story with no writing. And so drawing is writing for one. and two drawing and writing and the actual text work together and they don't just happen one after the other, they happen together. And so we need to create spaces in the classrooms for kids to be able to do that too. So thank you for sharing that. That's awesome. Yes. I'm learning that the visuals and the text, even, even as an adult. Um, Okay. So the second slide here is um, in, in that the idea generation time that may be, you know, that may be a few days or it may be a few years, you know, it has, it's different for every story, how you're gathering information. But when you, when I feel like I'm ready to, to go further with it, or I have the time, or maybe like in a classroom setting, or as an adult, I may have, I have a deadline that I have to sit down and I have to just push through and do something with the idea, whether I feel like it's ready or not. Uh, so I might just start with a completely yucky draft. Just get it all down. It's going to be awful. There's going to be lots of spelling mistakes, lots of grammar mistakes. Um, but I just want to kind of get it down really fast on paper as much as I can without trying to edit myself. And then I also do the visuals too. So that would look like little bitty drawings, which are called thumbnails. And um, <laughs> my thumbnails are actually bigger than some people's thumbnails. I have to have them big enough to see what a little bit more of what's going on than some people need. But um, and these that you're seeing here are actually a little bit more developed thumbnails than I start with. When I start thumbnails, they're they are they're kind of unlegible. Um, they're really sketchy, stick people even. And that is totally okay for those first thumbnails. And that helps me I know where I'm going next. And then, yeah. And then when I feel like I've got at least a draft, it may not be the very, very first roughest draft that I start showing people, maybe the second or third, when I feel like I've edited a little bit, um, taking it the best as far as I can go with it, then it's time to show someone. Um, I have a critique group, a group of um, writers that I get together with every month. And I have, uh, my husband is always a great first person to look at my stuff. Now he, he's learned to give really good feedback after years and years of me showing him things and editors, my agent. Um, So then I just kind of start like that first version on the top left is one version. I'll get some feedback. Then I'll go back to my project. I'll do some improving and I'll have a second version. I'll show that 
on over and over and over and over and over and over and over. So here I've got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve versions of the story. Each from version to version, it may not have a a huge amount of changes, but sometimes they do. Sometimes it's a complete overhaul, you know, and sometimes it's just taking out, you know, a certain character and, you know, or something. But between each of these versions, I've gotten feedback and all the way to this very last version on the bottom right, that's the version that I sent to a publisher in hopes that that they'll publish it, that they'll like it enough to publish it. So, so when I get it to my best, but it takes a long time to get it to the best. So these are my dummies. One thing I think I hadn't noticed in the very beginning was that these each of these is a stapled packet. Like, right. you know, at first I thought it was just like one page out, but each oh, of those. Yeah. So to think about all the different pages that are in each of those dummy packets. Um, yeah. So my dummies are kind of like just Word documents that I turn into PDFs, but you'll see later from KFI, she actually cuts her paper and folds it like a little book. So you can do that too. Um, just two different ways of making little little dummies, little book dummies. So that's that's, that's kind cool. of my process in a nutshell. Um, <laughs> that's awesome. Yeah. Two more things, and there were so many things, but for so we can move on to the other authors. But two other things that I was thinking of that I hadn't thought of before too is even the vocabulary that you use like I don't I don't know dummies and thumbnails and that type of thing but for teachers to start using that professional vocabulary with kids really helps them to build their their ownership and their identity as as real authors as young authors um, and then also just the variety of people who are in your feedback and critique community is really good to hear about too it's not just your writing group or not just your editor but that your husband or your friends or other people around, I think is also really good for, for kids to hear. Thanks so much, Shannon. Yeah, yeah, and also those people though, I have to trust their, um, have to respect their opinions. Like I may not show it to my best friend who's always, or my mom, probably wouldn't show it to my mom because she would think everything I do is great because she's my mom. So that's important too. <laughs> yeah, that's a good point. Thank you. Yeah. Hi, my <clears throat> my voice is all like froggy. Um, my name is Kay Fai. Uh, can you, I, I'm not muted now, so I think you can hear me. Uh, I live in San Francisco. I have a few books that published last year and I have a couple coming up this year. But the two, or the one I'm gonna talk about is called A Normal Pig. And I wrote and illustrated that. And um, I, the other uh, book I put up here is Noodle Fint, which came out with Enchanted Lion last year. But, um, I guess one thing that I wanted to talk about today and something that I've noticed about my own process is that my books tend to be very character driven. And um, at least at this point in my life, they all kind of have like a very strong central theme that's usually about like identity or thinking like questioning things like why are laws the way that they are? And, so things like that. Um, though everyone, I think, when they're making a book has like a central question, but that's always something that kind of surfaces for me as part of the process more towards the end to think about like, well, what questions did I have with this book that making this book enabled me to answer? Um, so the way that I think my process tends to begin, and like Shanda said, my process changes for it's always changing. And I think that that's a good thing to have your process always be changing. Um, but one thing I've always done is I've kept a sketchbook. This is the sketchbook I have. Um, I just have like a leather cover for it so it doesn't fall apart, but I can slip these like notebooks in and out. And I have a lot of these and I like them because they can fit easily into bags. I know the feel of the thing. So if I have to like, like Shanda said, if I need to like grab my sketchbook because I want to make a quick drawing or take a note of something, I know the feel of it in my backpack. Um, so I spend a lot of time doodling in this and um, sometimes I'll draw with friends in my sketchbook. Sometimes I draw if I'm like waiting in line somewhere. Um, I've started planning out books in my sketchbooks too because I kind of like thinking of them as a record of my process. And the one thing that I wish 
wish I could do because they're not digital. I wish I could search them, right? Like I wish I could be like, oh, I remember I wrote down something in a sketchbook. I think it was in like 2015 about this talk that I went to. But you know, you have them all kind of there and it's, I think there's something nice about having it on paper. And I have this feeling that I'm not like an, you know, I'm not like a, a, a psychologist, that there's something about writing down an idea with your hand, shaping words and letters is sort of like, there's some sort of connection to your brain that just helps things to stick a bit more, for me at least, as opposed to typing something. Um, because I think of like letters as drawings, right? So I have this sketchbook that I keep. And in the sketchbook, you'll see that there are a lot of characters that I draw. And often these characters will kind of come out of nowhere. I might not ever draw them again. It might just be something that I think is funny or like a kid that I notice that has like a particularly like cool outfit on or like animals that I see. And then after a while, if I look at sketchbooks over and over again, which I don't do a lot, but I try to do, um, I will start drawing that character over and over again. And then sometimes after a while, someone just keeps on showing up and this character sort of emerges. And through drawing that character over and over again, I kind of slowly get to know them and um, figure out kind of like what their needs and wants and see if they have a story that they want to tell me. Uh, and then I start taking that character like I did in this slide, which you can see, and kind of drawing the characters around them. Like what world are they in? What world do they inhabit? What questions might they have? And then soon enough, I kind of have this entire cast of characters that I get to work with and play with for a while. <laughs> I love how some of, sometimes there's been like the opposite too, color. You know, you've got his white spots on a darker, pig and then the opposite here and even just where the little eyes are placed the expression and how just the subtle little things that you've done there oh, um, yeah I loved hearing you talk about your notebook that's another thing that we talk to students a lot about is is having a notebook that's individual to them and that that's a space for them to play around with ideas and for ideas to start to develop and us finding like the words you used you said um a character just keeps showing up and I slowly get to know them and then they tell me if they they I start figuring out if they have a story to tell me, you know, it's like, it's almost like you're not in control. Like it's, it's the process is like coming to you as opposed to you creating it. You know, it's like the more I draw this character, he's coming to me. The way that you word it is, is almost like the character starts telling you what needs to happen, which I think is a really interesting way of thinking about it. Um, yeah, I mean, you know, there's a certain kind of faith, I guess, if that's the right word that comes with like making books, because I'll tell you what, I have tried this before. I just like hammer my head against a character in a story and that character just is shy and does not want to come out or it's like the story is just not happening and you just, sometimes you just can't force it or you're going to force something and you're like, you know, your reader can tell like, this is pretty convoluted. And maybe that's when you run into stuff like making characters that are like very stereotypical or characters that are like, okay, I know this character. I've seen this. This is not anything new or interesting. Okay. So I think um, thinking about, you know, Linda Berry writes about a sketchbook as a place to go to as opposed to an object. And I think books and this is something I learned early as a kid if I want to make myself disappear in any situation I just open a book right and I can disappear <laughs> and I feel like that's been like a big lesson of quarantine like when I have like the patience if I can read a book like I can just like go off somewhere else and the characters are characters you know you um uh, Linda Berry writes about when you finish a book sometimes you get to the end and you just kind of like hold it when you close it there's something about that, like, you know, having that book. And then you can, like, say you gave your book, the copy of, like, a book you just read to a friend, and then they lose it. And you're like, well, I guess I'll get a new copy. And then you get a new copy, and you're like, it's not the same. <laughs> like, there's something about that, like, physical book that you just, like, I don't know, there's something about it that I, uh, you care more about, right? Um, so, yeah. Absolutely. Uh, so then I take this character that's kind of like appeared and I put them in a situation where they have to deal with a problem and the character needs to act. So um, a while ago someone told me that there's like this Greek word for drama which is actually something like drama but it's like the word for drama that means literally translates to the word for action 
And I love that idea because, you know, it's like a character needs to do something. So I think of it when I'm thinking of this character, I was making all these stories for a while where nothing would really happen to the characters. And so they were just almost more like vignettes. And I think they were, I think they were very interesting and very funny, but they weren't really a story um, or like at least like a Western story. So I think especially in picture books, in American picture books anyway, or if you want to sell a picture book idea to a publisher, um, your character generally needs to change or do something or be changed in the end. Um, I haven't seen many examples of picture books otherwise that don't follow that kind of formula, at least in the US. Mm -hmm. I love seeing that word change and end it just even in your notebook too there. Well, you need to have like, I, I, yeah, you, you need to have like a, a um, finish point for yourself, right? Um, and actually, so I can show one other thing just like in my camera over here that I thought was kind of interesting. Um, when Shanda was talking about doing thumbnails, I've started doing thumbnails like this. I don't know if you can see this instead. It's, I have these teeny tiny um, sticky notes and I've realized that uh, the blank page for me is really intimidating. And so I've started just like, if I can make this like as throwaway as possible, I find that it helps me in my process to just like jump into it more. And it's a little less intimidating because I can move these thumbnails. I can like, I can layer sticky notes on top of each other. I can take them away. It's just with pencil. I don't really have to think about them, but it gives me a sense of like visually how the story will change over time. And I think about it in terms of, um, I think about it a lot like I think of film. It's like I want to have make sure I have a variety of camera angles, right? Like close-ups and establishing shots and landscape shots and maybe something from above and maybe something from below. So I like to have that kind of visual variety throughout. Yeah. Um, but in terms of writing, what did I write over here? Writing as like kind of my own way of learning. This is somewhat related, I guess, to like the visual side. But um, I like when I'm making a book, one of my favorite things is to use it as a way to learn. And because I think if I'm making a book and I am not, I'm not emotionally, intellectually invested in it, it's sort of like, why am I doing it? Besides like making money, which is also very valid. But you know, if I'm going to be spending six to eight months to a year of my life making something many, many hours and a lot of all that money I would spend on paper and supplies. I, you know, I will, I'm going to have to figure out some way of like connecting to it. So um, usually a lot of what I will research for a book, it's like this big period of um, like what you mentioned in that um, graph that you showed is collecting information and just like adding as much clay, as you said, as possible, which I love that metaphor. It's just like, you need to have all your stuff, right? And for me, it's like a lot of articles, a lot of books, a lot of other picture books. And one thing that was important to me when, or that kind of really resonated with me as I was building up this visual world and this narrative for a normal pig was this David Graeber article called The Bully's Pulpit. And it was, um, it was basically, the story is not necessarily about bullying, uh, but it, when I was thinking about a normal pig, I was thinking about, it's like microaggressions, but how uh, institutions all, almost always like reflect and support like structural bias, right? So in this example, in this article, he was talking about how in schools, like say, say you're getting bullied, right? Or if like as an adult, if you're in an unpleasant situation, like, you know, if you're walking to the street and someone starts yelling at you, you're response is to leave, right? Like you don't, you're like, I don't remember this, I'm gonna leave. But in a school situation, it's like, you can't leave. You know, you're legally obligated, you have to be there. So in a way, if you keep on being, if a student keeps on getting bullied by another student, it's almost like the structure of the school holds the student in place while they, which is why bullying is so terrible, right? Um, so I was reading about this and I really wanted to have this moment in here of, the way that a lot of people who are who are bullied have to respond like at a much higher aggressive level right because you really want to be left alone and it builds up and it builds up and then often students will get punished um, by like an authority figure in the school and uh, so I wanted to have like but she's like in in this example like she is the one that gets caught and sent to the office and there's this idea of right you've heard it all the time in schools um, 
I don't care who started it. But in this situation, I just wanted to show like, actually for students, it's like, you know, you have this very deep sense of justice and it really does matter who started it. So I was pulling in and I was like writing about like my own experiences. And I was talking to a lot of friends about their experiences in schools, especially um, my friends who grew up in communities where, um, you know, there was like a dominant paradigm and they were outside of the dominant paradigm which is basically what the story is about and just sharing ideas like well how did these things make you feel how did the institutions that you were in fail you as a kid I mean that's like a lot to write about in a picture book but in some ways I mean that is like the greatest triumph for me if you can take those very real feelings that still you know stick with you from childhood as an adult and you're able to channel it into a book and describe it in a way that still feels like it's resonant, kids will understand it, parents can talk to them about it. That feels to me like you know, a success. Okay, um, so this is where publishing uh, this format, so you have to take these ideas and stick them into a 32 page format. And I showed how it looks in, how I do it now, but you can see it looks almost like little teeny tiny books. And so once you have your character, this is like the part where it's like a problem, like problem solving, where you have to like, get it all together and make sure the pacing makes sense. And, and then uh, once you start adding the images, you realize you can take a lot of the words out because you're already telling the story with pictures. And if you do both, it's almost like redundant. And I feel like this is a very subtle thing that is fun to teach kids about mm -hmm. or teach students about is like, oh, you've already told this in the image. You can actually just like trim the words and you read the picture you know along with the text but the text and the image are telling um kind of different versions of the same story i think it's is, so you know, interesting to look at the different ways that you guys do your layout and the different just materials and sizes and folds and you know sticky notes versus just white paper and the the way it's all laid out and making those choices and how it just works it's just like it just works well one way you know i think that teachers that aren't in the habit of doing a lot of writing might not always think about how much we're limiting students if we say this is the material that everyone's going to use and this is the way that it needs to go and this is how many pages you're going to have and how challenging that it would be if, if any one of you were to be told those restrictions as you're creating you know but it's it happens so often in a classroom setting um, and and it's also just uh, not real you know, to, to what, to what would really happen. So even if they get good at that school way, it's not necessarily preparing them for when they're going to have to do it on their own in the real world. They might say that teacher isn't here to hand me that booklet. And so what should I do? You know? Yeah. Um, I mean, we're going to move a... in the interest of time. We're going to move, move, um, move on, but go ahead. Go ahead. Kate. Oh, I was going to say, it's a very like intimate, exp it's a very intimate process, like figuring out your process too. It is. Well, that's why we're so lucky to have you guys. I mean, we're literally sitting in your homes, in your workspaces, listening to you talk about this. It's so fascinating. And, and we're going to have so many great things to show to teachers. Thank you. Mika, do you want to? You're on. Yeah, mute still. There you go. Or we can't hear you yet. Sorry, you're on, you're on mute. Hi. Hi. Hi, I'm Mika Song, and I'm an author illustrator of a few picture books. And I'm working on a graphic novel right now called Donut Feed the Squirrels. Um, and the other picture that's up on the screen is a picture book that I illustrated that's written by Jen Bailey called A Friend for Henry. Um, and just listening to what everyone else, like Shonda and Kate Fire, were saying, um, I have a lot of similarities in their process. Um, so the part that I thought I would talk about would be more um, to do with after you've collect, been collecting in your sketchbooks and your post-its and in your head um, and just dreaming and daydreaming about your characters and your ideas. Um, when you start to try to see if they'll turn into a story and how I kind of sort that out for myself. Um, so this is an image from my graphic novel um, that comes out in a few months, Donut Feed the Squirrels. And it's not, it's, it's, sorry, it's not actually in the book at all, but um, 
it's a sketch, one of like 15 or 20 sketches um, that just kept, like Kefa was saying, re reappearing um, in my sketchbooks. And um, I was really taken by this donut truck that was parked outside my neighborhood. Um, every Sunday, my old neighborhood, there would be this donut truck that would make fresh donuts for you with a donut machine. And I just thought it was so magical. Um, and usually that's enough of a reason for me to like write a story about it as if it's something that I think is so, so unique and, and magical from my life that I want to show, share it with other people. Um, and the other thing is there's a squirrel dropping into the, to the, um, the pipe there, the, the chimney. And um, there's a lot of squirrels in my, in my neighborhood and um, they're really wild um, animals, but they're really small and cute too. So um, I was very inspired by them as well. Um, so I, I love what you said there about the, the machine being so magical and how that, so going back to when we heard from Shanda too and talking about where her ideas come from, well, and Kate Fide, where those ideas come from. And what you said was, it's something real that seems unique and magical, so much so that I want to share it with other people. And I think that that's, you know, just another idea of where, where these ideas come from, from all around us. You know, it might, it occurred to you as magical and you need to point it out, even though someone else might have seen, seen the same thing and not seen the magic in it. It's like now your responsibility, you know, to, to share it, which it's a really cool idea. Well, if also if I haven't seen it yet in another person's, in a book out there or in a story out there, then, or in the way that I see it, then I, I it will still be like bothering me that, <laughs> that I want to share this idea that I think is so bad <laughs> with someone. But um, yeah, so then from this image, I, when I started, sketching um a diagram of the way that i um turn it into a story and so i usually start with that scene which would be that first paper i drew with a big storm cloud on it which is just all my ideas kind of um in my notebooks uh or in the post-its or in your brain and then i have um different ways of mapping that idea out um, and it just sort of helps me to start to get it out in writing. Um, so the first one on top would be one sentence description of your story. I usually come up with that like six or seven times over and I usually start writing that one sentence to describe the whole story at the, near the end of, of, draw, of drawing and drafting. And um, the second paper down below is one paragraph that describes the whole story. And I, I have multiple versions of that as I work on the story and realize what it's actually about. Um, and then the very bottom one is the outline, um, which would have the parts of the story broken down. And I actually use, I usually just put the numbers of the different parts down first before I start filling them in. Um, and then another on the side there is an image of a girl um, of myself just throwing stuff that I collected. Um, that we collect ideas and characters and just throwing them into the water and trying to see if you can like make a path to somewhere special. So, so sometimes you have to hop around. And I guess these images on the left um, are kind of ways of mapping your idea. So it'd be mapping your, your, your story that you're, you're hopping around trying to form in the water. Um, and so you have to sometimes go backwards and go forwards and move things around and just give up on certain paths. Um, and it's just a fun puzzle. So that's, that's my metaphor. I just, that metaphor, I literally just came from the river and I'm picturing myself trying to get to the other side over there and, and not, and not get my cover up wet or whatever it was, you know, it was like, I'm going to go, no, and now I got to turn and back up and, and that idea of writing too, that, Again, going back to the idea that it's not linear. It's not like it's gonna, you're going to get from here to here to here in this really straight path and then perfect, you're done and you return it in and let's move to the next one. It's, it, it needs to be cyclical. We need to be able to jump back and forth and, and, and give kids that, that space to do that. Um, does, that is, does that prove challenging? When you're throwing those rocks in and trying to see their stick if, or, or where they're going to give you the next spot to hop onto, how does a deadline work with that, right? So with your playful process, does that then help you start 
okay, time to get it figured out? Or how do you work with deadlines? Well, it's really good for managing stress I, for myself because I, I always can sort of look at the rocks that I've laid behind me or in front of me or, you know, the two or three that are in front and I can kind of show it to people and say, hey, look, you know, we have the, like 50% of it is done, even though in my mind, I know that at some point I might change the entire 50% still. Um, and that's also a good way to manage stress for me is that I'm not worried that everything has to be perfect. Once I put this rock in, it's there forever. Um, it's just sort of to keep moving and to keep working on it. And sometimes I don't, I don't always work on it. And sometimes I just take a break. Uh, if you can manage that with time, like even if it's mm -hmm. just a short break, um, even like five minutes, just to, if you've been thinking too hard about it and getting nowhere, you might as well just take a break. And then sometimes you come up with really good ideas afterwards of how to get from this rock to that rock. So one part of your story to another. That's awesome. That's so awesome. I think, I think for, for kids to hear that, you know, taking a break and then, and then the fact that I, I heard an argument there for portfolios, for keeping every piece, every rock you've tried and thrown in, keeping that, that's all that work that minor might not end up being in the end, but all of that work was helping you get to your end path and is then like kind of proof of your work and your process and your, and your progress as well, which yeah. I think yeah, that's awesome. Thank you. Yeah, and then these are just um, just showing you exactly how I sort of write an outline on the left page and then slowly start to fill it out with whatever I might have. Um, so I have the image I see on the outline on the left up for number four, I have the image of of the squirrel jumping into the truck. And I just give it a name. I just give the character a name. That, that's not the name that it ended up being. It changed names like 20 times. Um, but it's, it's good because you don't have to worry about it. You can just keep going instead of spending one hour or one month worrying about the name and never you know, moving forward. Because once you start to see the, the character do things, you'll know what the name is. It'll come to you and it'll all make sense. So. Um, yeah, you're just giving placeholders and jumping around. That's what I do. And then the um, the right hand side is examples of how they at the uh, this is the wrong draft actually, but it's how it looks when it's filled out before I edit it. Uh, <laughs> and that's it. Yeah. Even what you just said there, that's the wrong draft. I mean that tells us there's more than one of these, right? That there are so many drafts instead of that idea of I'm done with my draft which is what you hear kids say a lot, you know, like, because they've seen that, okay, now I'm done with, I've chosen my, chosen my topic, check. Now I have done my draft. Now the teacher is going to make me do something to this draft that I already feel like, you know, <laughs> so, so just hearing that there's so many different versions. And, and I want to go back. I wanted to look again at this too, just that idea of how many different ways we can, you yourself have given yourself to do outlines and summaries of your own work you know that any one of those practices could be one that I bet another author on this call or I would or a student would maybe try out and say oh maybe I'll try out doing a one paragraph summary of what I think my story is headed you know or maybe I'll try this out they're all they're all tips and things that kids could try out and that's what we try to make many lessons in classrooms as an invitation it's like this is something someone's tried I invite you to try it out too and practice to try you know try out that strategy and see what it what it does when you do that it's it's like that magical thing that idea of magic you don't know what might be, be magical for your process yeah cool thank you anna hi everyone my name is anna aranda and i am an author and illustrator i'm originally from mexico city uh, lived in France for a little bit and then landed to Cali in California. Uh, and so a lot of my work is inspired by Mexico and its colors. And you can see a little bit there. I want everything to be an explosion of colors and joy. Um, and I like sharing those kind of stories with kids where it's something very colorful. Um, and when I talk to kids in school visits or other uh, places I want to encourage them to be creative and think outside the box and find different ways in which they can use their creativity uh, by in telling stories right so it can be using different mediums or 
telling stories from very silly characters or just using fantasy as a way of telling true stories, uh, things that happen in actual life, but using fantasy uh, as a metaphor and like doing metaphors for that. And um, so I'm, I'm gonna tell, I'm gonna talk from another part of the process, which is telling a story through shapes and colors. Um, and so the way I start is, uh, my stories are also very character driven, even the ones that I've illustrated for other people, it always starts with a character. And so what I start doing is I don't, I start from little to big, right? So I start by just using shapes and using like a, a Sharpie or like a brush pen and I do all the silhouettes of the characters. And so I know, like I try to have them be asymmetrical, to be very distinctive so that if you're like looking from far away, you recognize like, oh, this is a chupacabra or this is, you know, a duck or this is, uh, you know, another animal or it's someone we we know who it is right and so when i start i do here you can only see a couple of those silhouettes but i did for that book like pages and pages until i found out like who this character is uh and even after that the character changed like in the beginning the chupacabra used to have like flowers in um <laughs> next to the ears and it was very different um and then once I have the silhouette figured out, then I do what's inside, right? So I do, I use pencils and colors to see uh, what's the detail, how the eyes are, like what's the character outside the silhouette. Um, and after that, I go with color. So I, I usually like to show it to kids or show it to friends or just see what other people think about. Uh, but in the end, it's more a choice of um, like, if the characters are a certain color, then how is that going to be impacted by the background? For example, in this book, the character is purple and the backgrounds are green. So I wanted it to be a character that can blend a little bit, but maybe sometimes like you can still see it, but it's not super flashy against a, um, the background. So it's still a little bit like a mysterious character. I just, I just love listening to you talk about color. And when you said, that sometimes the color depends on, I thought you were gonna say the character's personality, but then thinking about background surprised me because I thought, of course, of course that makes sense, you know, but, I, I, but it's not one of the things that would have occurred to me. And I know that that's not something that occurs often to teachers is to think of, well, what's the background gonna be? If you're picking your character's color, you know, you might wanna think about how that's gonna play on, on the background of the page. It's like, whoa, you mean the background isn't always gonna be the top half blue and the bottom half green because if they're standing on the grass you know like so just all of these different ways for them to to be seeing your work thank you that's it's, yeah, it's so fun no, also to look at yeah, all these different kids, they're like orange and like a little bit more flashy so they like we see them first and we're like oh these are the characters but wait what's happening in the background and in the end uh, like my love for color i mean i just love talking about color and i love everything about color and when I work in a book, I want it to be so that every time that you turn the page, it's like a different color experience. So like there's something different about each page and there's something new to discover in each page. Um, and so after I figure out who the characters are, their colors and everything, I choose a technique. Um, and then for example, in this, um, in this book I chose, I used to work before uh, in a very complicated way. I used to do scratch boards, like in the very first book that I did, it was scratch boards. And I used to do a lot of printmaking uh, when I just started uh, illustrating. And I thought like, I need to do something that's a little bit more uh, direct and that's a little bit uh, less time consuming and just more enjoyable. So I had to manage different ways to just incorporate play and ways to be more spontaneous in my work because otherwise I would be just like, hating what I do and I would have just quit my career <laughs> by being so complicated. Um, so I'll show you uh, in the next spread, the, in this book. So it talks about this character, the chupacabra and what it likes to eat. So I thought um, the theme will dictate the medium, right? So if it talks about food, then I'll use food to paint. <laughs> Um, and each book, for each book, I create different games, right? So for some books, I would hide like an element in each page. In another book, uh, 
like I I chose to do like different color plays. Um, and then when I do sketches of new books, I also think about what kind of game I want to do. So there was this other book where it talked about memory. So I thought um, I did a couple paintings of like based in my grandparents and like ancestors and things. And I, um, I buried them in my friend's garden and then I would go water every week and see how it reacted with those things. And the idea turned, I mean, I loved how it turned out, but I don't think that will become a book, but the process of making it, I really enjoyed it. And it showed me that I just have to, you know, uh, explore and uh, let myself be uh, surprised by what I, found, what I found out and it might work or it might not, but I'm still having fun. So it's all good. <laughs> um, so in this book, I used, um, in the right, you can see these little balls and they are, it's called coccinial. So there's like, they're little insects that grow in cacti in Mexico and Peru. And when you squeeze them, it turns like, I mean, like this color a little bit, but very, it's very, very strong, like my magenta kind of purplish color. And um, in another life, when I was a tour guide uh, in, in this exhibition, I, it was about um, surrealist painters in Mexico, in Oaxaca. And a lot of them use this technique, right? And what they would do is they would crush these that they would have like in their backyard. They crush them. And depending on what you add to them, it would change color. So if you add acidic things like lime juice, things like that, then it will turn towards the yellows. And if you add bleach or things that are more towards the others, um, like, what do you call it, like basic? Do you call them like base? Yeah. And so it would turn towards the blue and purples. And so I thought, I, I really want to do this for the book. And um, I, I figured out, I mean, someone gave me some of these. Um, and I, I used it for what, just one of the spreads in the book, because I wasn't really sure how it was going to turn out. <laughs> and so what I did is I just threw some of that pigment. Well, it was kind of um, more liquid. And so I had like, my inks like for the background and then I threw a little bit of this pigment and then I had um, an orange and so I squished it and used a toothbrush and I really like painting with toothbrush because you don't really know how it's going to turn out and so I threw a little bit with a toothbrush and then I, I put some of this tahin uh, spice that I put into everything I love it <laughs> uh, and then I, I just waited to see what would happen and it was the result was really cool and really smelly <laughs> and <laughs> and it was it was just very fun and I thought um, uh, you can see in the next spread how it turned out so like in the left you see some of the textures like there's in the middle picture on the left, there's like this splash like this, and that's the orange reacting. Uh, no, on the right a little bit and up. Up here? Uh, oh, yeah, there's here. Like, yes, in that one, there's like a little splash there, and that's like the oh. orange juice. Yeah, that one, it's the orange juice. Uh -huh. And and I don't know, I really like those kind of textures. And I, it reminded me a little bit when I used to do lithograph that you, like, you can do these textures, but you don't know how they're gonna come out. And I really like that to be just uh, surprised by the process. Um, and so, so if you don't know how it's going to come out, do you experiment on lots of different pieces of paper, and then and then you know you have some idea of what it's going to do? But then, I mean, clearly each one is a little bit of a gamble, right? Like you don't know how that one dot is going to go, but you know it will spread the color in a certain pattern. You know, I, I did try it in smaller papers, but then I thought I, I'm just going all going for it. You know, yeah. I just, if it works or if it doesn't, it doesn't matter because I'm already trying it, but it yeah. ended up working. So perfect. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that's so cool. Yeah. And that's something that I, I talk about, um, like in some workshops, like to encourage kids to be creative with whatever they have at home, like spef specifically, like especially now in the pandemic, like you just find something that's in the kitchen, something that you have, you know, you can paint with coffee, salt, just you know, draw with your right hand, your left hand, your foot. You can be creative in any way and still tell stories no matter what you're using. You can still be creative in any way and tell stories no matter what you're using. Like that's like such a great 
ending thought, I think, you know, and, and speaks to what each of you guys have talked about. Um, I think also coming back around to today and, and how the context in which teachers are, are teaching today through a screen, not in person, and how we can still encourage each author to have their own individualized personal experience and we can still give them access to resources, human and um, potentially, you know, food resources are, that are at home and around them and, and show them how those can be used in different ways to create what, um, what characters are in their notebooks are telling them need to be created and what stories are telling them are magical enough and need to be told. Um, I think it's just this, this conversation is super exciting and it's going to speak to so many, so many teachers. And, and, and budding um, authors and illustrators, of course, as well, who I think will also watch this. Um, um, we probably, I don't know how we're doing on time. I think we're getting pretty close to an hour, but um, one thing, um, this is just my little slide here, but only to say that I'm gonna be going back through this um, recording and, and writing up some mini lessons that can be initial resources for teachers We've already talked through a bunch of them and I have notes of so many more and, and as I was listening thought of so many more that could be taught to students based on um, all the work you guys are doing and just the exciting things um, that you're getting, you're getting your work done. Um, so that will be one resource that will accompany this recording is some example mini lessons that can show teachers how to structure those mini lessons to keep them short and um, then help them to then be responsive to their own students' needs and, and create their own mini lessons using the, the, this, this conversation. What are, um, so do you have any other thoughts, Christina, or any of the authors um, to wrap up? Yeah, let's open it up for last thoughts. Um, I think it's, it's just so beautiful to see this work and so exciting and very inspiring. So. Well, I think as someone who makes picture books, because, you know, there are only so many picture books that get published every year and they're only like, you know, only one person wins the Caldecott Award. I think there's a culture of authors and illustrators not really sharing their process because they're very protective over their process. It's like their intellectual property and something that I found really refreshing about you know, this conversation and other conversations we've had is just this sort of like generosity and trust that we're all sharing our process with each other. And I mean, I've learned so much by seeing other people's process that have been writing down so many notes and seeing others process that it's been just like, um, I think I would just say to teachers that, you know, this is something like sharing, like built, like starting in elementary school, a process of like sharing information and being generous with your information and not feeling like people are going to steal your ideas or whatever is, um, would be a healthy thing to contribute to creative culture at large. Got some sticky note action going on gonna try that <laughs> so I've learned a lot too this has been really cool so thanks for including me I, I think I, I was thinking about how we kids get really really early on they say things like well, don't copy me you know and and who's giving them that message um, and how we can instead do like you said be generous be generous and and know that the way we all learn what i say to my kids when they say that to each other is i say how do you think you learned how to say your name you copied me while i said your name maya 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 over and over again and that's how we learn and that's how we grow and so um it's not so much copying as it is like kfi said being generous with our ideas and and learning from each other and thinking together yeah i mean um I think it's a really, really important idea that she brought up. Um, I think all of my ideas have also been found from other people's ideas. So um, I think it's, it's important to just keep that going. And, yeah. And just that understanding, like I know we've all heard it now that we're adults, but that there's nothing really that new under the sun you know right. that it's all just sort of recycled ideas you know 
and but nobody but me no could do it exactly like I do it and nobody like you guys can do it exactly the way you do it so I think that's that would be good to share with students too that you know there's nothing new but at the same time <laughs> I don't know that got kind of crazy and complex but you know what I mean yeah, yeah absolutely there's nothing new but everything's unique right, right. right. like this is the only now right now yeah something that I also thought was kind of a common theme that many of you talked about is how you find your stories and how like everybody is everyone is passionate about something and has a story to tell and then each of you talked about something that came to you that bugged you enough that you really need to get it out and like tell its story like a character presenting itself so many times that you just have to tell their story and maybe it's something to encourage kids to do like tell stories that are meaningful to them that inspire them or just things that happen in their life that they just need to get out and tell the world Thank you all so much. This is really lovely and such a wonderful conversation to be able to sit back and sort of, you know, absorb. So I'm really excited to, um, you know, share this with our colleagues and, and sort of keep engaging in these conversations. I wanted to give a special shout out to both Katie and KFI for organizing this. So thank you so much. And thank you to all of you for participating today. This is such a gift, I believe, to, to our entire network and to all the youth who are out there working to tell their stories. And um, I think uh, the mutual inspiration, I think, is, is healthy and good for all of us. So. Absolutely. Thanks all. Thank you. Aww. Aww. <laughs>